Basically, it's just the, the part. The primal woman, I think the feeling is, it just feels so overwhelming when you go in there. I remember when I first started going there, I feel like I'm going to die. But I had a good therapist who was able to be there with me. And I, and I just felt it. It was, an, it was a nonverbal from her. She can handle this. I just, I felt it. Because she had done her own work. We, and I think that, and I'm going to say, I think that's why I'm very effective with kids, because I've done my own work. I have cried buckets. I have allowed myself to work through and cope and find ways to explore with all my interventions to make sense of these big feelings that are in the right brain that aren't sensible at all. They're quite messy. And help organize them. And put them in parts and pieces and externalize them and see them for what they are. Yes, they're really trying to feel felt. They're trying to get you to feel their experience with them. It's called projective identification. And actually that's therapeutic. When we feel something from someone else and acknowledge it, wow, I think you're really trying to make me so mad right now because there's a part of you that's feeling so mad right now. It feels helpless. I feel that. I feel how helpless you're feeling right now. And I'm so sorry, I wish I could do something. What can I do for you right now, honey? And they may not be able to say, and you know what, honey, I'm just gonna stay right here. Never say it's okay. Never say it's gonna be okay. You just say, I know this is hard, I'm right here. That's it. You don't even have to say anything more. You can say, I feel what you're feeling, honey, I know. It's having empathy for the pain. I know this is painful. This is hard, I'm right here. Let me just say something. When we do it abruptly, uh, oh. separating mother from baby at birth. This is an absurd and savage practice that goes against both instinct and the neurobiology of bonding. Because of the strength of the first imprints, a newborn should not be separated for a minimum of eight hours according to best birthing practices. The less interference with the bonding process, the better. Think about that because and I'm not a brain scientist, but the mother, her mirror neurons, the baby's reflecting, also their mirror neurons, they're having experience. The mother releases oxytocin. That's the bonding love hormone, and the baby, also with the mirror neurons, they release oxytocin. So I come into the world, even though I know you may not remain my mother, and parent me, but I, remember, I come into the world, <sighs> not, yeah. oh, okay, now with a new mom, I'm not familiar, I, where'd she go? Ah, 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 where's my mommy? What happened to her? This smells different. We go into, you see? I mean, think about it, right? Doesn't it make sense? Yes, but it's hard to do with this practice. This is new stuff, new understanding. So I'm not. And three things with new brain science. When we think one negative thought, we need three other, three positive things to help soothe and nurture that part. So I tell kids there's three things. You're doing the best that you can, and that's good enough. You're learning, and it's okay to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Modeling, I make mistakes. And that's how we learn. And with kids that are very hard on themselves and feel easy, easily criticized, um, um, take their mistakes very personally, that, that means to me they're experiencing shame. Shame is, I'm all bad. I cannot separate myself from my action. When I do something wrong, I'm all wrong. When I make a mistake, I'm the mistake. I just, I cannot differentiate, so we want to differentiate for them. When you make a mistake, you're not the mistake. And I, again, I'm talking with my hands. I help kids go, you're not the mistake. The mistake is the mistake. That's out here. That's not who you are. You're learning how to do this. And that's the modeling from the parent, separating that out. And I'm going to help you grow that part that can feel good about yourself when you make a mistake. It's OK.
today. Right? <coughs> we are not perfect. And these kids are hard on themselves. Because, they, again, they don't want to seek your disapproval. They don't want to disappoint. And for the adoptees in here, they can be people pleasers. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't let a hair go out of place. I used to be very perfectionist. <coughs> the heels today, I'm like, screw the heels. I'm putting on flats. I am a real person. I'm good enough just where I am. Nonverbals, which is our, one of our nonverbals, is our faces. If we appear frightening to our kids, we can go in that fight mode. I'm going to protect myself right now from you. And if it keeps happening, they have this mirror neuron memory, working memory. Whenever I see that face, I'm going to fight. So we have to do otherwise to create a new experience in relationship with them. And it takes, it can take years. Which I know parents don't like to hear of that consistency. And a little hair trigger can trigger it. You know, we're human. We make mistakes. I'm a mother, yes, I make mistakes. However, the biggest piece, the nugget, is there's repair. And repair means so much more to a child than leaving them alone and a parent being ashamed and feeling guilt and not coming back to the relationship and going, you know what? I'm sorry. You matter. We matter. I made a mistake. That is so, that teaches so many things to a child. So we all have the impulse to not have a gap and act out. We all have that. We all, our brains, it takes 31 years for the brain to fully develop as per Bruce Perry. 31 years now is the research. We're dealing with kids. Their, year, their years, their ears. Their brains aren't fully developed. They don't have the capacity like we do. We have to lower our expectations also with these kids and meet them where they are. And one of the ways you do that, uh, and I'll say it right now, is when you see your child acting out, step back. Go, what age am I seeing right now? Because typically if parents come to me, they go, she's 13, but she acts like a three-year-old. I go, that's right. Let's step back. Let's look at her story, because what's hysterical is historical. I'm going to tell you that right now. What's hysterical is something to have to do with the past, unresolved. What happened when she was three? Let's go back. That's where we need to reparent her emotionally, psychologically. Not it, it's not this. Honey, I know you're 13, but Jeanette just told me you're really three. I'm going to treat you like a three-year-old. No. It's the parents step back and going, she's 13 chronologically, physically, but she's really three. And I need to be mindful of that. I need to lower my expectations. She can only take one direction at a time. I need to be patient. Let me go back to my parenting books. Three-year-olds. How do you parent a three-year-old again? And you have to go back and lower. And let me say, lowering is not going to mean oh, she's going to be three forever. We have to just go back and rewire the brain at that time, and she will thrive. She will flourish. She will grow up. Okay? We can't measure, oh, did she reach four next month? Or did she reach five? You'll see as she's more capable of regulating. She won't be at that three-year-old level anymore. She'll be more tolerant. And I'll show you a child, like if, if somebody comes up to you at the grocery store, are you adopted? And then you look at your child and go, excuse me a moment, what would you like to say about that? W-I-S-R-E, you want to share something? No, nah, she kind of looks like a nice lady, but no. Yeah. Or you know what, I, I do want to tell her. That's right, I was adopted. Thanks for asking. You have any other questions about that? I mean, that gives the child the choice. You know, we want to walk away. I don't feel like talking about this with a complete stranger at the supermarket. Give kids choices. So that's what I'm saying. Don't make the choice for them. It's their story. <coughs> they lead the way who they can share it with or not. So they feel a sense of control. Um, 
My grief, I have formed a bond of attachment with something. My grief is like a death. Grief allows me to process my loss through mourning. Mourning is crying, thinking about it, making candles, making a collage, putting pictures together, honoring like you would if someone passed away. It's the same experience. And if kids who are removed early don't have that, um, and we don't know where the birth families are, which, you know, a lot of international adoption, we don't know, okay? Um, they will perceive, because unless told otherwise, they're going to think they died. Unless told otherwise. Now, what I would recommend for those who we don't have, we don't know who they are, do a memorial anyway. Do one anyway. I do one with candles. I have the candles of the birth mother, the birth father on Mother's Day, Father's Day, the day before, weeks before their birthday, to honor those two people who brought them into the world. And we can just write them a letter, honor who they were. We could draw a picture of what we can imagine they may be by looking at ourselves. Honor that loss. I had an adoptive parent come to the support group. Her mother had recently died. And it was the first time she saw, oh my god, I didn't recognize my daughter had this right at birth. And she went home and she told her, I'm so sorry, honey, for your loss. And I recognized it through my own loss. It was huge for this mother. And it brought them closer together.